Okay. So I, I don't, I can't see my next slide. Okay, so I, I know it's not a big deal. Uh, you probably, you know, if you've done presentation before, you might know what's coming next. But um, I average between 250 and 300 slides. So, so, so knowing the next one is kind of handy and uh, I won't be able to do that today. So um, please bear in mind with me. Um, so I'm going to start. Hopefully it's, it's uh, all of us. So my name is uh, Daniele. I work for a company that's called Learn Kubernetes. Uh, we are based uh, in primarily in Europe, so London and Milan, and uh, just recently in Singapore. But I'm not here to talk about what we do. I mean, we do training for Kubernetes, that's basically what we do. But I'm here to talk about a little bit of a story that started a year ago. So a year ago, I, I was here in, in Singapore, actually, and there was a really interesting tweet on, uh, on Twitter and it was from a guy in Japan, Manabu. And I can't read Japanese, and I don't know if you can. Uh, good for you, good for you, really good for you. Uh, but it basically says, what if I take a Kubernetes cluster and I tamper with the networking? Will Kubernetes still work? Can I still use my cluster? Or, you know, it's gonna go and, and fall apart. So we, we basically took that as a challenge as we said, can we actually do that? Can we actually take whatever Manabu has done and replicate the findings that um, we found at that time? Now, before we dive into what we actually did, a little bit of a recap of what Kubernetes is and, and how it works. So usually what happens is we have a collection of servers, like this ones. So those can be on-prem servers, those can be virtual machines, and as, as engineers or DevOps, then the challenge is how do we actually manage a lot of them? And then how do we manage them efficiently? So one way, it's not the only way, but one way is to actually use Kubernetes. And, and the way it works is we have a master node which is going to receive all the commands. And then we actually have the other nodes joining the master. And then when that happens, we call that a cluster. Okay, And then nodes, I mean, in these pictures, they are all the same, but it actually could be of different sizes. The only things that we actually care is the memory and CPU of those nodes. So as soon as you add nodes into the master, into the cluster, then you're going to add memory and CPU to the overall memory and CPU of your cluster. So that's all what Kubernetes is. It's basically just merging all of your servers into a single machine. Okay? You can imagine having Kubernetes as your single VM in a data center. But why would you do that? Well, the reason is pretty simple. Now, you don't need to deploy to a particular server anymore. When you deploy, you can just deploy directly into a single machine. So I just say, Kubernetes, please deploy me this application four times, and this is going to create four applications inside my infrastructure. Then, because Kubernetes has got you know, this layer of abstraction between yourself and the data center, then you can take a smart decision. You can look at the nodes and say, actually, you know, I'm going to place the application like this. And that's basically the beauty of, of what we see with Kubernetes. And then this kind of design leads to some interesting results. The first one being, well, if Kubernetes can actually analyze my infrastructure and take care of it on my behalf, then when a node goes away, Kubernetes is smart enough to actually move that application to a node that is available. Okay, so we, we said, uh, Kubernetes, please give me four applications. It realizes that one was gone, the node was lost, and just rescheduled that application into a new node. And that's great. So we've got reliability, it's, it's built for fault tolerance, and everything works. Now, if you are deploying, so this is, this is a simple example, if you're deploying inside um, a cloud provider, you probably have a load balancer um, on top of your nodes. And then what happens usually, the node goes down, the, load, the node is detached from the load balancer, and then Kubernetes would reschedule that application somewhere else. That's basically how Kubernetes works, and 
and, and why, why we find it so useful. But um, the other interesting things for Kubernetes is that you know, it's, it's designed to scale. So instead of having like three nodes, we, had, we might have more nodes. Um, as an example, this is basically how we structure application in Kubernetes. We usually have the application underneath, then we have an internal load balancer, which we like to call service, because it's not an overloaded, overloaded term at, at all in computer science. And then at the top, we have like what we call an ingress, which is like an external load balancer. But we, we talked about scales. So what if I'm really, really keen to have a really, really large cluster, but I don't have enough application to actually fill the cluster, like in this case. Okay. I was a little bit too uh, keen to scale my cluster, and then there are only two applications and three nodes. So if I access the first node, would you expect a response from the application? Yeah? Yeah? Second one? You know what's coming. If I access the third one, no. Anyone else saying yes? So, uh, are you accessing yeah. Part of the yes, it is a part of the cluster. Then yes. Then yes. No. Then are you accessing application or no? I'm. I'm actually going to the nodes, trying to access the service. What would you expect? Yes. 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 Five or two. Five or two. Anyone else? <coughs> Okay, let's. <laughs> so, <laughs> is the traffic lost? Yes. yes. Is it a timeout? Yes. Yeah? Oh, <laughs> all of those. Is it a 404? Which one is it? Uh, actually, none of them. It, it works. You get a response back, even if there is no application on that node. Okay? So, why is that? How, how does that work, right? Is it, is it magic? Um, so the first, you know, when, when I look at this, uh, the first time was, um, is the load balancer actually doing the smart routing? So if you look at the application and say, I've got two applications deployed in my cluster, and there is uh, like an application load balancer for, for AWS, or, you know, an application load balancer in Azure, then that load balancer actually knows where the application is, so you can just route the traffic directly, right? Which is Great. Like this. Does that sound fair? It does, right? Uh, unfortunately, I don't want the logic to stay in the, in, 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 in the load balancer, right? There will be cloud-specific load balancer. So it, it's not really something that I can take away, and it would be really, really hard to implement if I've got an on-prem cluster. It's also a little bit of a single point of failure and, and a little bit hard to scale, depending on what you do. You can imagine that if you're doing an on-prem data center, then scaling a component like this could be quite problematic. Plus, you need to sync those rules somehow. So this is not what Kubernetes does. This is not how we route traffic inside a cluster. The other option, right, could be, what if we actually route all the traffic to the, the master node first? So if the master knows, knows everything about a cluster, so it, it makes sense to go through the master node. The master node is going to tell me where the application is deployed, and I'm going to route the traffic to that node. Fair enough. Like this. Does this work? Well, it's great, right? I've got someone saying no. It, <laughs> it does work, right? So. Um, it's called vendor agnostic. Yes, it's going through the master. That doesn't belong to the cloud provider. We solved the problem. But it's a single point of failure, and it's really, really hard to scale, right? How would you do that? How would you scale those master nodes? And you need a lot of master nodes. Um, imagine, so we're talking about, if, you, if you're deploying on GKE, which is the Google Cloud Platform, we're talking about 5,000 nodes. How many master nodes do you actually need to support 5,000 nodes? Well, it should be some kind of ratio. There should be exactly, but then we start having all this sort of conversation, and it's really complicated. This is not actually what happens in Kubernetes. The first idea we had wasn't too bad, right? So this load balancer that knows everything and can route the traffic, that's actually a really clever idea. 
The only problem we had it was that it was outside of a cluster and not inside. So what if we actually move that load balancer and we break it apart and we have one in each node? Okay. If we do that, that's quite a clever idea because if we go and if we have traffic going directly to the node, we can go through. We can go through again. The next time we go to the load balancer, well, if it knows all the routes, you can just say, well, this is not mine. Go somewhere else. Because this is actually what happens in Kubernetes, right? We have, on each node, we have a, a component. Of, it's, it's actually what happened in Kubernetes. So you can see it's got cloud vendor agnostic, redundancy built in, because the more node we, have, we add, the more load balancer we're going to have. And, and it scales with, with the nodes as well. So the, the component that does that in Kubernetes is called Kube Proxy. And it's a binary which is installed in each of every, every node in your cluster. And that component is in charge of setting these rules in the node itself. And, um, but, but the question is, how does this Kube Proxy know the roots, right? I thought the master would know the roots, so is, what is Kube Proxy doing? So it turns out that when you ask for um, a deployment key Kubernetes, this is, this is what happens. So we ask for deployment for an application, then the request goes inside Kubernetes. The first component to receive the request is the API server. The API server stores the request into, into the database. The database will store that request for you. And then there are a series of components inside Kubernetes that will analyze the status of the database and create the application for you. And there is a third component, which is the scheduler, which will look at, at, the, or, at your application, will make sure that any of the pending elements are going to go and, and be scheduled. At that point, what happens is we've got, your, we've got another component inside Kubernetes. So next to Kube proxy, we've got the kubelet, which is like a glorified agent. The agent goes and asks the master node if there is any update, so any application that should be deployed on that particular node. If it finds one, then it's going to delegate uh, the creation of the application inside a node. So when that process happens, then the application is created, an IP address is assigned, and that IP address assigned is then returned back to the master node. So you can imagine that the master node has got all the information. So when he created the pod, when he created the applications, what it did, we had like a table like this. We knew where each pod was because we assigned that with the scheduler to the node, right? But we didn't know the IP address at that point in time. Now, because the kubelet created the application and, and sent back the message to the master node, now we also know the IP address assigned uh, to that particular node, okay? So we have all, all the information inside the master node. So the list is always up to date. So what that means is that when you add an application, then the master node will be updated. And when re you remove one, when you add another one, it's going to be updated as well. When you remove one, it's going to be removed as well. So that happens every time you create or delete one of your application inside your cluster. So that's not the only list, though. There is another list, which is to do with what we call in what we call service, which is basically an internal load balancer. So the internal load balancer has got a list of IP addresses as well. So in reality, we've got two long lists inside a master. The first one belongs to the pod, to the applications, and the second one belongs to the load balancer, basically. So what kind of IP addresses am I routing that traffic to? So those two lists are quite handy, right? But they live inside a master node. So Kube Proxy doesn't know anything about it. So what happens is, is that Kube Proxy will ask for this list to the master node and set up routing tables on each and every node inside your cluster. And that's basically the magic behind Kubernetes. So what happens when, so we can finally answer the question, what happens when I hit the node and there is no application? And the first thing which is going to happen, Kube Proxy will read the routing table and say, hey, there is nothing here. Go somewhere else. And somewhere else is actually looking at the table, looking that there is an internal load balancer. The internal load balancer points to either port 1 or port 2. We look at port 1 and port 2. We, tech, we take the IP address. We finally reroute the request. 
Okay? So that's what happens in Kubernetes every time you hit a node. Now, that was only the intro for my talk. Okay, so now you know a little bit about how Kubernetes works, how the traffic is written inside your cluster, and uh, and you know when we are ready to we are ready to actually break things, right? So now that we know how it works, what, what happens when when things go wrong? So the first scenario is that let's say we've got somehow we are a little bit unlucky. And then one of the nodes, the one on the left, cannot connect to the master anymore. What is going to happen? Uh, yeah, so because the, um, the servers on the left is not able to connect to the master, it won't be able to update the routing table. Okay, so if any request comes in, it's still going to use the old routing table, which, you know, could be good, could be bad, you know, depending on how, how many pods, how many applications you created and destroyed in, the, in that time, uh, it might still go to an existing application or it could, buy, it could fail. Whereas the other nodes will work as usual, right? Because they can contact the master, they can download the list and they can continue working. So that's what we see when, when there is a, something like a spread brain. It almost works, it's kind of good, and the, the disadvantage is that it could be a, routing, a stale routing table. Um, eventually, when, when, the, when the network recovers and we have a single network, then that node could contact back the master node and just get back the new list. So the good news is that eventually Kubernetes will converge and then fix everything by itself. Good news, I guess. So the second one, um, we start breaking things. So the second one is actually, what if I kill that process inside a node, right? So we talked about kube proxy as, as, as an agent that it's inside a node, but what if I actually go and stop that process? What is going to happen? Well done. So if a new pod comes in and we don't have kube proxy, that's the routing table. If a new, uh, so, sorry, if a pod crashes, well, there is no one to update those tables, right? So it's going to stay the same. So we get similar scenario to what we had before. So for the existing pods, it's going to work, and for some others, it won't. So it's basically not great, but it still works. Um, but like you said, it's, it's a daemon set. So in Kubernetes, we've got something called a daemon set, which is basically just a fancy way for saying that when it goes down, when it crashes, it's going to be restarted. Okay, so that's how Kubernetes is going to solve the problem for us. And yeah, it almost works. Uh, so we've got this stale routing table. And um, we, we can kind of make it work. So that, that's basically number two. So now let's go even more deep into this. What if you have not necessarily good intentions? Okay, and let's say that the routing table is lost, as in you go inside and you tamper with the routing table. Okay, so you change the values or you remove the values without anyone noticing it. And that's basically what uh, Manu Manubu from, from Japan did. So that's what we found out when, so when we published this article uh, last year, um, he basically described this situation where you go inside a node, you actually tamper the routing table, and then you see what happens. So this is the scenario that we're going to analyze today. So we've got one single node, one single load balancer, and then the plan is very, very simple. We get into the node, we drop the routing table, and we see what happens. Okay? So before we move forward, what's your guess? What is going to happen? It's a split brain scenario. Split brain scenario. Let me see. Ooh. Ooh. I, won't, I won't do spoilers. What is going to happen? I think the source of truth is still like CD. Okay, okay. So, is it going to work? It's going to recover. You've got a lot of faith. I like that. Anyone else? Continue work. Continue work. Just because we said it? 
<laughs> Anyone else saying that it's not going to work? OK, we'll see. So what I did, what we did is, um, so we took that back to the team, and then uh, we just replayed everything that Manubu did. And um, well, the story is a little bit more complicated. I'm sure there is a romance somewhere as well. They're going to make a movie. But in essence, this is what happened. So we basically set up a very simple loop in Bash that what it does is every second is going to print a date and uh, the value that we get back from the application. Okay? And the application is quite simple. It always replies with hello world. Okay? So this is what happens. Okay, that's quite easy. Okay, every second we see a response from, um, f from the application. And then what we do is we are very, very nasty. We get inside a node, we drop everything. Okay, and then we observe what happens. So we expect nothing happens, nothing, nothing. Oops, it's back. It's back. Nice. I mean, uh, I. There is a little bit of a gap, but I can sort of deal with that. Uh, but it works, okay? And then, but if you look at numbers, so it's uh, 47 up there, it's 14 down here, that's just probably 27, 27 seconds. What happened in this 27 seconds? And I don't know, why, why 27 seconds? Why not, you know, five or 10? So, it's about 30 seconds, okay, so we, we can leave it there. So maybe something is going on with, I don't know, maybe load balancer, right? So we have too many things to, you know, analyze. So the easiest things we can do at this point is to actually remove things from the equation. So we have a load balancer at the top, we just remove the load balancer and we repeat the same scenario, but this time um, we got direct to the node. Okay, so same loop, this time I'm gonna curl, uh, the IP address of the node, and we try again. And this is what, what we see. So I see hello world, we drop the routing table, nothing, oops, time out, time out, back. Okay? So why this time we see the time out, and then before we didn't? Okay, when we go directly to the node and we use curl, then we see the timeouts twice, and, um, and then it goes back up. Well, a couple of interesting things here. First is that the curl times out at 10 seconds. So this is making me think basic, maybe the load balancer took a little bit longer to time out. But by the time it took you know, to time out, the, the, the cluster for some reason recovered, and then we didn't see that time out happening. And so that load balancer must be having a time out which is greater than 10 seconds. Then the other weird thing is that someone is fixing the routing table for me. And then the last one is, why 30 seconds? Why not 20? Why not 10? What's going on? So you might have guessed that um, this, is, uh, this is sort of cube proxy's um, fault. Okay, or, or, well, I guess fault, I guess it's probably the right, reason, the right word, but what, what is happening? Well, it turns out that these rules that are set up on each and every node, they're actually synchronized on a, on, a, on a regular interval. So there are two flags you can set to actually make sure that uh, your routing tables are refreshed frequently enough. So if something happens to these routing tables, like me going inside and dropping the routing tables, then it can be fixed in in, in appropriate manner. Okay, so these are, for example, two flags. So the first one being um, how often, so this is 30 seconds, and then what's the minimum time after every refresh? So this is to make sure we don't do too many refresh at once and we overload the master node. Okay, so these are two, two mechanisms that we have to control this routing table on each and every node. Um, so if, if you were lost a little bit while we're doing uh, the, the curl, this is what happened basically, just as a visual representation. This was a, our setup, this was the routing table, and what we did was we 
kill the routing table, so remove the routing table from the node, and we made a request. That request couldn't like, would go through the load balancer, the load balancer would forward that request in the node, but because there is nothing listening on the node, it would just, you know, wait until, until the timeout. By that time, QProxy will recover, will refresh the routing table that will come back up, and then finally, you know, because there is something that can accept the incoming connection, and it will go through, and then finally will reach the application. That was what we did with, um, with this simple test. Okay, so these two flags, you can tweak them. They are part of uh, Kube Proxy. And um, that's basically everything I want to show you today. I've got a couple of things that I learned in the process that I think are really, you know, something that I want to share with you today. So the first one is, um, so and this is perhaps the, at least the most interesting for me is that uh, we originally looked at this problem a year ago. And uh, by that time, we wrote a blog post. Um, I took these same um, talks to another conference, and now I'm doing it again. And every time I give it again, I basically find an error of what I explained. And I need to go back and rethink about how Kubernetes works. Now, this is just to give you an idea that things inside Kubernetes are quite complicated. OK, um, they're quite complicated for, for a good reason, because we want to build a product which is reliable. But at the same time, uh, I wish we could do better with you know, documentation and explaining how things work. Now, I showed you a very simple example of networking in Kubernetes. But this is what it looks like with the nitty gritty details of IP addresses and routing tables. So the same as before, so it might be a little bit overkill, but this is what happens. So you go inside a node, you're actually requesting for an IP address which doesn't exist. That's another thing, weird things about Kubernetes. QProxy will kick in, will read that request, will realize that the IP address doesn't exist, will look at the table and say it doesn't exist, replace that IP address for a pod inside your network, then depending on the type of network you've got, it will go through a routing table and then go back to your pod. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated than what you see, um, what you saw earlier today, but that's basically just to give you an understanding of, you know, how complex are things if, if you start digging inside the cluster inside, inside Kubernetes works. The other things that I find really useful is article like this. So this is a pretty old article, but Julia Evans, she's, she's amazing. Uh, so this, this kind of article really go down, deep down in, into what uh, networking is in Kubernetes to give you more idea how things are actually, uh, uh, how they work inside Kubernetes. So the other things which I wanted to share is that how do you get better at this kind of stuff? Well, the only way to get better is to actually try and, and break it, try and, and, and become better at it. So the two resources that I would recommend is the CKA practice, practice environment, which is basically just a collection of uh, challenges. And they are also useful if you're interested in, in being certified. And then the first one is a, just a collection of um, useful I would say useful challenges. Uh, they are not, some of them are not particularly good, but it's just you know, good challenges for you to, to tackle and then in practice. So I think it's something that I would recommend. And then how do you protect against things like this? How do you protect against you know, someone going inside a cluster and dropping the connections or you know, noticing that you won't be able to reach a particular application because uh, the routing table is stale? Now, there isn't a simple answer because it depends on what application you're building, you know, what are your constraints, how you tweak the flags. Uh, but, but basically, it all boils down to how you monitor your infrastructure and how you control your pods and, and everything else. So I think I wouldn't be able to give you just one link and say, this is the holy grail, go and do it. You will need to understand how the application works uh, to actually fix it. And that was it. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope you enjoy. I've got a couple of that. So if you like to talk, I wrote the same thing as, as a blog post. Okay, so this is the blog post that we wrote. Um, 
and then it goes through the same example and you can also check out the code and try it on your own. So maybe if you've got a production cluster, I probably wouldn't advise that. Uh, but if, if you'd like to try that at home, yeah, please do so. I've got stickers. Okay, so just be careful with the sticker because the last time I did that, some, there was a guy who just went there and grabbed all of them. <laughs> all of them. And it wasn't fair for everyone, everyone else. Okay, so be by, mindful of other. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I guess so, but just, just be mindful of others as well, please. Um, any question? Uh, the question is going back to the situation on a split brain syndrome when you have uh, uh, no communication between the workers, right? In the networking world, to avoid this kind of stuff, you have a condition. You have to have a redundant network connectivity between systems. So currently, as I see right now, the Kubernetes networking is based on the uh, assumption that, that you should be able to reach between worker nodes or the worker and master no matter what. So redundant network is not needed. Do you think this is a right way to I, I think to answer your question, I hope I got the question right. The question is, um, can I actually use a redundant network for my Kubernetes cluster? I hope that's two words for, for what you described. Um, so to answer your question, first, so Kubernetes is built around three basic rules of networking. And the three basic rules are any application can talk to any other application inside a cluster, any node can talk to any other node and any other application, and the third, no, third rule is the application see itself with the same IP address that everyone else sees with. Okay, so these are the three rules. Now, if you satisfy the three rules, you can implement any type of network you want. So usually what we see um, when we work with, uh, with, with clients is that they ask us for um, a Kubernetes pod, a Kubernetes application to have two IP addresses, one which belongs to the um, um, one network, which is the network of, of the cluster, and then the second one is actually a network somewhere else. So you could have like multiple networks attached to your pods. I don't think it's quite what you asked for. Uh, we, so what, my, my, my question was specifically related to the nodes. The nodes are communicating with each other. There is a node inter-node network. But that's one network. Pretty much because you do not have a two network interfaces per node. That, you have one. I, 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 that's, that's correct, but it's also not always the truth. Okay, so sometimes, for example, if you're using Amazon, if you're using EKS, for example, um, the network for the nodes and the network for the applications are on the same network, which is the VPC. Okay, but if you take the same configuration in G GKE, which is Google Cloud Platform, then the no exactly, exactly. So I think as long as you satisfy the three rules of your networking, then you can design a network in the way you want. And EKS having one and and, um, and, and GK having another. So I think, depending on what you're building, I probably have got very little understanding of what you're trying to achieve, but I think as long as you can satisfy the three rules, you should be able to have a redundancy in, in the network itself. So can I, so actually you can, as he said, and he gave the public cloud example only, even in private cloud you can build multiple card and do that. And the other thing, uh, so you talk about a split brain situation when they started, right? So split brain situation, in this case, the entire thing works on the core level. So you need to have three to start with. For example, in CD or the Kubernetes API, you need to have three instances to have core level if you want to see it. And then one goes down, then still two, they elect by themselves one master and they can continue to work. So split brain problem was here was when it was HA1, uh, active passive HA, then it was. This is more of an active, active cluster, that is one thing. Two, it starts with odd number. So even if one goes down, the 
the other two still are able to let and do it. So that's how this and other thing that works here is the eventual consistency he talked about. Over the time, things are able to settle down. The entire design premises in this case is that we call fault tolerance rather than fault resistance. So if something goes wrong, other things will still continue to work for some time with whatever information they have. And once the other whatever went down comes back, it will try to sync up and try to figure out what is the best configuration scenario it can go into. So that's a little uh, design or philosophical difference in there. Fault tolerance versus fault resistance. And that that that's what play, that's what plays a role in this set of uh, systems. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, cool, that was it. Thank you very much.